Greetings, everybody. Let's talk about refrigeration. Actually, specifically, ordinary vapor compression refrigeration, which is the fundamental technology behind uh, most home refrigeration units and commercial refrigeration units and heat pumps and air conditioners. And the reason we're going to talk about this in addition to Rankine, Rankine is useful and gives you enough context to understand other cycles, such as the auto cycle you may eventually encounter. Uh, refrigeration is something that's used so widely you really should understand it, and also it tends to be a little like magic. To help us understand it, I want you to imagine that you were making a pot of spaghetti or macaroni and cheese, or something that involved boiling water on a stove. So we have some water in a pot, and the pot is on the heating element on the stove. And the water is boiling vigorously and changing phase. We have some steam uh, leaving the pot. Now, the normal way to think about this is, oh, the water is getting hot, the water is absorbing energy and changing phase. You can also think about it as though the pot is removing heat from the stove. So that is, we are cooling or at least removing energy from the heating element by having that pot there. So this perspective is useful because it helps remind us that boiling fluid is uh, into a vapor is a great way to remove energy from a system. In fact, um, that's how you and I work, right? We sweat, and that is using vaporization to remove energy. So the trick with a refrigerator boils down to, aha, uh -huh, getting a liquid to boil and remove energy at a low temperature, which keeps things cold, and then so that it can keep moving around the cycle, we need to condense it where it is hot. And so how the heck do we do this? We do this by changing the pressure. So if you have a fluid under very, very low pressure, it'll boil at a low temperature. And then if you increase the pressure by a lot, it will condense at a, uh, at a high temperature. So that is the trick we are doing uh, with a refrigerator. And that's a big part of why refrigerants which are the working fluids that are moving around in the backs of, in the tubes in your refrigerators and air conditioners, um, that's a big reason that those are uh, specially designed chemicals. Uh, they have to have the right temperatures for uh, condensation and evaporation. So we're gonna plot this out on a TS diagram. So there's our TS diagram. There's our phase envelope. Remember where entropy is high, uh, we have vapor and where entropy is low we have liquid. And then out at the top is the critical point, um, which probably isn't important to us right now. So for a refrigeration system, uh, we start at what I'm going to call point one. And at point one, we have 100% saturated vapor. And the saturated vapor is at a low temperature, uh, which means it's also at a low pressure. And what we're going to do here to move from one to two is we are going to compress this vapor. Compressing this vapor usually drives its temperature up considerably, um, and our compression will uh, will start by assuming it's reversible compression, so that'll be a, a vertical line on the TS diagram, but we recognize that we probably don't have reversible unit operations here, and so our entropy will actually go up. That usually means the temperature goes up. So we go from uh, this initial low temperature and pressure to a uh, much higher temperature, and that's at a higher pressure. Okay, so we're, now we're at this higher pressure, and we are at the same pressure, isobarically, going to condense this vapor to a saturated liquid. So that's what's happening between two and three, and you can see that on the graph. Three and four, this is a bit of a change, because right now it looks a little like Rankine. Here's where a big change is. We are going to reduce the pressure uh, on our saturated liquid, and we're gonna reduce that pressure by using a valve. And so we are going to, at constant enthalpy, reduce the, uh, the pressure, which will also drop the temperature. And that's gonna get us back to our original pressure. So notice we've got this thing, 0.4 is here under the phase envelope. And now, uh, at constant pressure, 
we are going to take our vapor liquid mix and we are allow it to completely vaporize. Okay. And so that's, uh, that's something that requires energy. So that's where uh, energy is going to come into the system. So I want you to think about, like, look at this, ponder this. What are the unit operations here? Um, and where is entropy, not entropy, energy coming into our system? And where is energy leaving our system? Uh, where are those both um, on this graph, but also where is that when you imagine a refrigerator? And uh, we will be looking at a refrigerator in class, or of course, if you have a refrigerator, you are welcome to look at it yourself and think about where these things are. So just uh, remember, step four to one is at constant pressure, which is uh, the low pressure, which is also a low temperature. Uh, const, uh, step two to three is not at constant temperature usually, uh, but it is at constant pressure all the way across. So let's solve an actual refrigeration problem. And the problem I've chosen for us to solve is to design a little bit of a refrigeration system uh, using a new or newer refrigerant. Um, we're gonna use the cycle we just learned, ordinary vapor compression. And uh, I don't know if you know this history, but originally uh, many refrigerators contained Freon, which was an excellent refrigerant but when it was released to the air, it uh, degraded the ozone layer. This was replaced uh, by R134A, which also did a pretty good job of this, uh, but when it leaks, it uh, contributes uh, significantly to global warming chemicals in the atmosphere. So we need something else. And uh, DuPont, an alum of Bucknell Chemical Engineering, uh, working at DuPont, was on the team that developed the newest uh, refrigerant that is currently being used in cars. So it's called Option or HFO1234YF, such a catchy name. So let's use that to design a refrigeration system with a low temperature of zero degrees Fahrenheit and a high side pressure of 200 PSI absolute. Uh, how much work is required from, uh, into, to be put into the compressor to make this work? And what are other things we can learn about this refrigeration system um, from those two settings? I have included for you what, uh, what's called the pH diagram, pressure enthalpy diagram, for this refrigerant on the next slide. And so you should watch that um, and the uh, other pH diagram reading video to get an idea how you might go about using that diagram to complete your energy and entropy balances. Okay, I want to do an example of showing you how to read a pressure enthalpy diagram. Uh, this is often confusing because it's got a whole lot of information on it, and also because we just learned how both refrigerators and engines work on a temperature entropy diagram, and now we're going to use this one to, to glean information, and it's completely different. So where you expect there will be straight lines may or may not be straight lines, where you expect curves may or may not be curves. Uh, so I want to take us through uh, a bit of an example here. There's another example, a different video online that you can also watch with a different pH diagram for a different refrigerant. Um, I'm not going to do exactly the example from the last page because I want you to do that, but I'm, uh, I'm going to pick this instead. So let's say uh, we have a low temperature of minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit and that uh, we are going to um, have a compressor that is able to uh, increase the pressure up to uh, 100 PSI absolute. Okay, so that is talking about 0.2 and this is talking about 0.1. So let's find uh, our first point on here. Well, this is pressure versus enthalpy. So where the heck is temperature? So I'm gonna highlight uh, a temperature line for you. Temperature is here in, uh, in blue, if you can see this, they're solid lines. So I'm gonna follow the negative 20 degree temperature line 
And so uh, it's nearly vertical in the saturated liquid. And then as it hits the phase envelope, it, it goes horizontal, which we expect, right? In the phase envelope, neither pressure nor temperature are changing. Uh, and then uh, when it comes out of the phase envelope on the saturated vapor side, it, it drops down towards the right. Okay, so that is our negative 20 degree line. Uh, so if we want to know about saturated vapor at negative 20 degrees, which is 0.1 in our uh, phase, our, our steps of refrigeration, that's going to be right here where that intersects the phase envelope. I've circled it in yellow. All right, so what else can we learn about this point from this graph? Well, uh, this is a pressure enthalpy diagram, so we can go horizontally and read off what our pressure is. So this is our pressure at point one, so P1. Um, it's not quite it's not quite a pressure of 20, but it's also not quite, you know, we can't say it's exactly 10. So I would say it's probably like 16 is a more accurate way to think about it. And remember, this is absolute, so it incorporates atmospheric pressure. Uh, so that's that's one thing we can learn. Another thing we can learn is what's the, <coughs> pardon me, what's the enthalpy of point one? And I'm going to label this as a one just so we remember this is where we're talking about. Uh, so the enthalpy is right off of the, the x-axis. So we need a vertical line. So I recommend getting a ruler, something that lets you trace a vertical line, but there's h1. Okay, so I made a little wiggle down at the bottom there. Uh, we're close to 80, we're a little bit higher than 80, so maybe like 83. Uh, and we're, we're, you know, we're dealing with some uncertainty because you're reading a graph. Okay, so if we want to proceed and figure out some things about point two, uh, point two is going to be somewhere on the 100 psi line. So I'm going to get my ruler out, and I am going to make kind of a hot pink line across at 100 psi, uh, just to get a feel for uh, where point two is going to be. Point two is going to be somewhere on here. Um, now we know our working fluid to go from one to two uh, must be going through a compressor. And that compressor we initially assume to be isentropic. So it's adiabatic and reversible. So what we really need here is a constant entropy line that we can follow. And fortunately, if you look, you see there's these dotted green lines that are the constant entropy lines. So they kind of go diagonally um, out over here. And so we want to find a constant entropy line that intersects point one. So do you see that? That's, that's this one right here. And we follow that line until it intersects the pressure or the temperature we know we're looking for. And it turns out we just stay right on the phase envelope here. So here is point two. Okay, and if we wanted to figure out how much work the compressor, well, that would be 0.2 prime, by the way. If we wanted to figure out how much work the compressor did, how much reversible work the compressor did, we would take out our ruler again and make another vertical line down from 0.2. And so the difference between H2 and H1, that's, that's our energy balance. That's our, uh, our reversible work. Now, uh, we might have have a uh, efficiency we could apply, and so that would mean true point two would be somewhere out to the right, you know, somewhere at higher entropy. And so it might be over here. And you notice, I'm going to point this out to you, uh, so if this is where two true is, you notice we are at suddenly a much higher temperature. Uh, than we thought we were at. Whereas, you know, if we were at reversible, our temperature is around 80 degrees. Um, but if it's irreversible, our temperature is 120, uh, which which should make sense. Um, then uh, point three, you recall, 
uh, comes from us condensing our liquid, our, our vapor into saturated liquid. So we're going to just follow this constant pressure line that I conveniently already drew all the way across till it hits the phase envelope, and that will be 0.3. So that's where 0.3 is at. And then finally, if we wanted to see where 0.4 was, uh, what would we do? Well, remember the unit operation between 3 and 4 is a valve. And that valves are isenthalpic, or that is, the energy balance on a valve is delta H equals 0. Uh, so that means on this graph, because enthalpy is our x-axis, that means on this graph, this line is going to be vertical. So I get my ruler again. Boom, I draw a vertical line. And so there is where 0.4 must be. So you see, without specifying a heck of a lot about this refrigeration system, in fact, like, so one pressure and one temperature, uh, I have done the, I have diagrammed the whole thing and we could work out all of the energy and entropy balances for this entire system from what I have done uh, just right here, just with those two pieces of information. So you can start with uh, knowing reasonable pressures to work between. You can start with knowing reasonable uh, temperatures to work between. Um, you can start with one temperature and one pressure like we did here. Uh, you could even start with how much work your compressor is capable of doing, and uh, you could find it that way. Uh, but that's how you uh, read the graph. Feel free to, oh, one other thing. There's a line, a set of lines we didn't use that I'm going to just call your attention to. You'll notice uh, these, this other like dotted black line up here, that's a specific volume, which is the you know same thing as density except backwards. Um, and uh, we didn't happen to need it for what we're working on, but if for, ever, if for whatever reason you needed the specific volume of the fluid, uh, you would get it by reading off of those lines.